our message today is about remembering the future, which sounds a little weird. How can you remember something that hasn't happened yet? But we'll find that out. <laughs> now, as I said, I love stories. And I especially love stories with a happy ending. I am a sucker for happy endings. But don't get me wrong. I'm not a fan of Hallmark movies, even though we watched one with my mother-in-law last night. I wouldn't choose to do that if I was at home by myself, but I, you know, watch them with my mother-in-law because I love her. And I don't like chick flicks, even though my husband does. <laughs> and I don't read Harlequin romance novels. I don't even know if they're still a thing, but they, they used to be. You know, my mom used to read those, and I was never a fan of those. Even though I like happy endings, I have my limits. But I also don't go to the other end of the spectrum. I don't like psychological thrillers. They just get into my brain too much. And I don't like George Clooney movies. Now, I like George Clooney, but most of his movies have really messed up endings. I don't know if you've seen them. They're, they're not that great. And, sorry, I don't listen to country music. It's just too sad for me. You lose your track, you lose, you know, if you play it backwards, you get your truck back, you get your dog back, you get your wife back. <laughs> Now me, I love a good superhero movie. I'm a huge fan of the Marvels universe and DC. I don't discriminate, I like them both. Evil is always vanquished and the good guy always wins, except in Infinity War, but we won't talk about that right now. That got me a little upset. Put it this way, if you haven't seen it, you shouldn't ever kill the good guy. It's, it's wrong, especially in a superhero movie. It just breaks the whole premise. I have such a need for happy endings that if I'm reading a novel and things start to get really intense, I'll actually skip to the end and read the last chapter and see how things finish. I know, it's terrible, isn't it? But I need to know that they're gonna be okay. And once I'm Good with that. Once I know, okay, you know what? It's fine. The hero doesn't die. It's going to be fine. Then I can go back and face the conflicts in the middle of the book because I know it turns out in the end. And every story has conflict. It's what makes it a story, right? You have characters. Some are good. Some are bad. Some are a mix of the two, like the rest of us. And like the rest of us, they face any number of challenges as the plot moves along, building to a climax, the ultimate conflict, after which things get resolved one way or another, unless it's a George Clooney movie. My story is filled with conflicts. Some of you have heard bits and pieces of it. And because I love happy endings, for a long time, I wouldn't share my testimony because I thought it needed to end with, and they all lived happily ever after. Well, if I'd have kept waiting for that, I would have never shared my story. <laughs> now I know better. Now I understand that we need to share our struggles with each other. We need to share with each other how God is helping us through the hard times, because he does. He's there, he walks with us through the fire, through the flood. And we need to share that and encourage each other with that. Your stories are filled with conflict as well. Different than mine, different than each other, but all our stories have conflict. And maybe you're waiting for your happy ending. And maybe you feel like it's never gonna come. In fact, many of us don't really see that happy ending until we meet Jesus face to face. But that doesn't mean that we can't live every moment of our lives filled with joy. Yeah, Bible says so. Even in the midst of struggle, we can have joy. 
with peace, and with selfless, extravagant love. And even though the Bible tells us how things are going to end, you can actually, you can skip ahead to the last chapter, and you can find out that Jesus didn't just ride into Jerusalem on a donkey in triumph. He also will return to earth one day in ultimate triumph. We have assurance of victory. We can read the last chapter and, and find that out. But none of us gets to skip the middle of the book. We, we don't get to just go from the beginning of our story to the happily ever after. We have to go through those various conflicts in our life stories. But we can choose how we are going to face each new page. What we believe about the future will determine how we live here and now. And today we're going to look at a page from Jesus' story and find out what he does when he knows he's about to face a monster. Uh, now the story's starting to make sense, right? <laughs> well, it's six days before the Passover, as Rod told us. And as it actually is today. Jesus knows that the day of his death is quickly approaching. The anger and power of his enemies are growing. And it's actually getting to the point where it's quite dangerous for Jesus to minister openly as he's been doing to the crowds. In fact, he's just come out of hiding so that he could spend one last evening a fellowship with some very dear friends. Jesus and his disciples have come to Bethany, to the home of Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Some names that might sound familiar to you. These three siblings are hosting a dinner party in Jesus' honor. It's a way of thanking him. You see, Last time Jesus dropped by to visit, he raised Lazarus from the dead. It was a pretty big deal. That event, in fact, created such a stir with the Pharisees that Jesus and his followers actually had to get out of Dodge for a while and lay low. But now they're back, and Jesus is happy to celebrate with those that know him and love him. And these three know him better than most. So if you're in your Bibles at um, John verse 12, or chapter 12, sorry, just turn back a chapter to verse, or to chapter, sorry, 11, and look at verse 1, and it reads like this. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. Same Lazarus we're talking about in today's reading. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Now take a careful look at verse 2. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Now at this point, this event hasn't actually happened yet. It happens in chapter 12. But John makes mention of it here as well. So keep that in mind as we go along. So further through the story, Jesus comes to Bethany where Lazarus has been sick. But by the time he gets there, Lazarus has already died. So look at verse 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus when he arrived, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She had great faith in him as a healer. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Well, here it looks as if Jesus is your typical comforter. He's speaking words of love and truth, but not really being super helpful. Martha answers, I know he will rise again 
in the resurrection at the last day. So again, she does have faith. She believes the word. She believes that Jesus is able to heal, but he wants to take her deeper. It's as if she's saying to him, you know, thanks, but that's, that's not really helping right now. But the words that Jesus speaks next change everything for Martha and for us. He says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this today? Yes, Lord, she replies. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who is to come into the world. Those are big words. The Messiah, the promised anointed one of God, the Son of God. This family knew who Jesus was, and the disciples knew who Jesus was, and they were celebrating. So we're Back in chapter 12, our, our scripture passage for today, they celebrated knowing that Lazarus, he was going to die again. And they celebrated knowing that the Pharisees were out to arrest Jesus. And they could come charging in and arrest Jesus and possibly the whole party at any moment. They celebrated knowing that Jesus wouldn't be with them much longer, as he told them. And in the midst of their celebrations, Lazarus, a living testimony to Jesus' power over death, reclined with them at table, had perfect peace. And Martha served everyone from a heart of love. And Mary... She must have been the youngest. <laughs> she was overcome with joy and gratitude. And so she did something so selfless and so extravagant that Jesus made sure we would still be talking about it until we are celebrating with him in heaven. Taking a container filled with expensive perfume, and I mean expensive, in today's Wait, money, it would be worth about $25,000. And to give you a little bit of perspective as a side note, Judas, who betrayed Jesus later to his death, he did so for about a thousand bucks. Mary took $25,000, probably the, all three of their life savings. They weren't rich people. And she poured out the contents on Jesus' feet. That's how much she valued him. And there was so much of it that she wiped up the excess, drying his feet with her hair. Everyone present at the party was blessed by her gift of love because the fragrance filled the room. Beautiful story, isn't it? But as we know, no story is without conflict, and this one is no exception. Judas, one of the disciples, who had followed Jesus for the last three years, he was angry, he was indignant that she would do this. And he said, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. But we know, as the Bible tells us, that Judas didn't actually care about the poor. He was a thief, and he felt robbed of his chance to help himself to what would have been a large deposit to the coppers. But Jesus defended Mary, and he defends us against our accuser. Leave her alone, he says. She did this in preparation for my burial. Mary's act of, was of great importance to our Lord. So great that, that he had John, the Holy Spirit, inspired John when he wrote the gospel to speak of this twice, once before it even happened in chapter 11, 
and again to describe what she had done. Mary knew who Jesus was, and she knew what was coming for him. And yet, she celebrated with him. She celebrated. They celebrated resurrection life even as Jesus was facing the cross. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. We have resurrection hope today. In Romans 8, 18, Paul puts it this way, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. And Paul suffered. This isn't some guy who just had this great life saying this. Jesus wanted Mary to keep that joy and that wonder and that gratitude and that love that she had even as she was facing the coming grief of his death and burial. Likewise, he wants us to live each and every day with that same joy, that same wonder, love, and appreciation of the very present future. And that is Jesus himself, who is the resurrection and the life. Our hope for the future is here, present with us, right now. Now we, we can't hold back time. We can't turn back time. We can't skip to the end of the book. And regardless of the monster that may be coming, we need to turn the page. When we're going through hard times, as, as many of you are, the last thing we want is for someone to come across with pious platitudes such as, this too shall pass. What we want is for someone to just be with us in the moment. And Jesus is the only one who can give us both peace in the present and hope for the future. His promises are not empty sentiment. Far from it. He has defeated every monster we could possibly face. And just as he sat and celebrated with his friends, celebrating the resurrection, even as he faced the cross, so too he dwells with us, giving us peace and joy even as we suffer through various trials. He gives us hope when we trust in him. I don't know about you, but I could use some hope today. And he gives us hope because he knows the ending from the beginning. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And he is always doing a new thing. And yes, this too shall pass. And when it does, Jesus is already on the other side of it. You will face many conflicts as you go through the story of your life, as you have already. But even the monster of death is not the end of the book if you put your faith and your trust in Jesus. How we live now reveals what we believe about the future. And if we believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and if we believe that he will do what he said he would do, then we can live in peace and in joy and with selfless, extravagant love because he holds the future in our hands, in his hands. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God of new beginnings and that no matter what we have gone through in the past or what we're facing right now, we can go through it with resurrection hope, the hope that we have of new life in Christ.
glorious Father. I lift up everyone here today and each one that we carry on our hearts that we're burdened for. Lord, be present with each and every one, near and far. Speak to our spirits today and assure us that because you have conquered sin and death, there is no monster that we need to fear. Give us joy and peace in knowing that you not only win in the end, you give us victory now in the moment. Help us to put our trust in you in such a way that our lives are characterized by the same extravagant, selfless love that you demonstrated for us on the cross and that Mary demonstrated for you. Thank you, Lord, that because you rose again, we can celebrate the hope of tomorrow every single day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul, whose life was filled with conflict, is beaten within an inch of his life several times, stoned almost to death, shipwrecked, you name it. He said this in Philippians 3, 13 to 14. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, and this is what we need to do, forget what is behind, straining forward to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So whatever we're facing, we can follow the examples of Paul, and Jesus and Mary rejoicing even in the midst of adversity while we remember the future in the present. Every ending is a new beginning. And in light of technical difficulties, we're going to forego the closing song. <laughs> so, if you'll stand and receive the benediction today, it is from Romans 15, verse 6. So if you'll just stand with me, I will bless you and you may go. So as you go about your week, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and be constant in prayer. God bless you. Have a wonderful week and go in peace. Thank you.